Yes, our speaker, as you all know, is David Parker. He's the superintendent here in Forest Grove and uh, has been here for a few years now. And um, I would not want to be in your position over this pandemic time. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say today, David. Um, thank you for the introduction, Janet. The What I would tell you is, is um, my presentation today is going to show a whole bunch of challenges. Um, but the funny thing about it is, is that the good news is, is like kids are in school and it's, we're, we're moving forward. And that's really exciting as I walk out and I've been walking through um, schools for the last four weeks and kids are at recess running around playing and, and I walk into classrooms and we're working on literacy. And um, so the good news here is kids are in school. Now there's lots of challenges with that and I'm gonna kind of roll through that. Um, I'm open to any questions that folks have. So um, as we're moving along here, I'm going to talk about COVID first. And I'm going to talk about some of the investments the states made in education, and then I'll take any other questions that folks have. Um, this is kind of the state's epidemic, what they call the epi curve, which kind of shows the number of cases over time. And what you'll notice here is on June, July 1st, we were talking about choice in um, health protocols and coming back to school and just running normal school. And since July 1, what we've seen is the Delta surge come in. And that's this curve right here. Um, what you'll notice is that we're definitely coming off of that curve right now. Um, we're not coming down at the rate that I would like to see it, but for the most part, this curve has been much, much larger than the curve we saw um, during the winter time last year. Um, which was kind of the, and again, I, what I think is interesting is this is this first um, April, March, May. If you look at this curve, that's where we canceled all school and went to online. And we're currently over here running school. So again, I think we've learned a lot in the 18 months that we've been in this pandemic. Um, this is a graph of kind of the seven day moving average. And what I want you to notice here is at the beginning left hand side of this is kind of the end of August. And what you'll notice is since August begun, we've seen kind of a slow, since September has begun, we've seen kind of a slow decrease in the numbers, which is kind of what we're seeing in schools too. This is for the state of Oregon. There's a couple of things I want you to notice about it. This test positivity rate of 7.4%. That's actually, once you get above four, that means you have active transmission in the community and whatever's happening in the community could be happening in our schools too. So that's kind of a number that we keep um, a close eye on. Um, in This is a graph of Washington County. And there's kind of two numbers that I want you to notice here. There's the one in the orange here. And this is as of about two weeks ago. And we're at about 371 um, cases per 100,000. That's high. Um, it's not as high for Washington County. We were actually higher in the um, middle November, December of last year. Now, the rest of the state wasn't. In this current surge, we're actually below the rest of the state um, that second curve would be higher. In Washington County, we're about 81% vaccinated right now, which is part of the reason why we're not seeing as big of an impact um, for the whole county. The second number I want you to look at, it's hard to see, but it's down here at the bottom and it's 8.7%. And that's our positivity rate, which means again, we still have a pretty active spread of COVID in our community. Um, the other thing to kind of notice here is, is that we're decreasing. We're actually down around, like I said, this one's about a week old. We're down around 300 cases per 100,000, which we are starting to decrease. And that's what we're really looking for. As a school district, we're, we want to see that test positivity get under 5%. And I'd love to see this. I mean, again, we were down to the 40s right at the beginning of July, 40 cases per 100,000 over two weeks. Um, we'd love to see that start heading down again. Recently, they haven't talked a lot about students, pediatric COVID cases, and there's been a lot of um, information in the news, some of it correct, some of it not. Um, but this is within about the last four weeks, um, OHA has started pushing out more information about cases, um, juvenile pediatric um, COVID cases. What, I, what this, and it's hard to see this, but hey, this is the only graph I could get from them. This line that runs across the whole graph, that's actually the, 
it's 20.3%. And that means that um, juveniles make up basically 20.3% of the population. Adults make up the other part of the population. And as long as the blue down here, these are the number of um, pediatric cases, as long as the blue stays below that line, then we know that this is impacting adults more than it's impacting um, juveniles. And what you'll see is since um, the end of August, we've now creeped above that line. And it's not by much, we're about 22%, um, juvenile cases are about 22% of the COVID cases um, in Oregon, and we run pretty similar in Washington County. But it is just, uh, there was some news here that this doesn't impact um, juveniles, and that's just not true. Um, again, in Oregon, we had a lot of kids out um, they're now in schools, we are mixing. And so how we manage that risk is very important. And um, how, we're, how we're managing that risk and trying to keep this, um, um, we want it to be proportional basically, which is, I don't want it crawling up above 20%. This is a curve of our pediatric cases. And what you'll see here is, is that last winter we had cases with juveniles. Currently, we're more than double, double and a half um, the number of cases. So we are seeing students um, come down with this across the state of Oregon. This is a breakdown by age group. So you can also kind of see who this is impacting um, the former curves here. And for the most part, our younger kids were not being impacted at all. But with Delta, we are seeing since um, the middle of June or so, we've seen a pretty direct um, increase in our 12 to 17 age group, our uh, 6 to 11, and our 0 to 5 group. All of those are, we've seen pretty large increases in. The interesting thing is right about here is when we started school, and you can see the age group 6 to 11 um, shot up right to underneath our 12 to 17. So again, this is impacting our students. What I have here is kind of our daily count of COVID cases and um, just a couple of things to take a look at, which is what we're finding so far with our protocols um, is that we're maintaining a fairly steady number of cases. Um, the top line there, uh, 914, we had 12 case, 12 student cases, 13 the next day, 14, 21. As kids get better, we have other kids who um, come down with COVID. But for the most part, between staff and students, we're averaging about 20 folks um, with active COVID. Um, I think what this is telling me is what we're doing in schools right now is working. We've seen, um, again, we have 6,000 students, and this is um, Delta is quite a bit more um, um, transmissible. If we weren't handling things well, we would see these numbers um, changing much more than they are. So we feel pretty good about where we're at. And I'm going to knock on wood when I say that because of um, we have a very, it does not take much for things to begin to spin. We've had um, in a couple of schools, we've seen maybe three classrooms now. Um, we've seen maybe three classrooms where we can actually show that there was spread inside the classroom. And in those, when we get to the place where we have more than three folks who come down with COVID, we quarantine the classroom and then run online for, um, um, usually it's somewhere between 10 and 14 days, depending upon when um, students and staff um, uh, get well. But for the most part, what I can say is what we're doing right now seems to be holding. And what, we're, what we've worked in our school district so far is everybody wears a mask all the time. Um, the only time when their masks are down or when they're eating um, for the most part, but it's masks. We purchased um, with some of our stimulus money that we got from the federal government, HEPA filters, portable air conditioners for every classroom and every space that um, kids are in. It's interesting, but there's a bunch of science and I'm a physics and chemistry teacher behind this, but um, just adding in, we most of our classrooms, our ventilation is we have about five, almost six air changes per hour. 
Um, by adding in the portable HEPA filter, we've added in almost three more air changes. So there's about 11 changes per hour, which means that about every seven minutes, um, we're, re, we're completely replacing the air. So again, the ventilation is one of the key factors in trying to keep um, the virus from spreading in our schools. So we have the HEPA filters, we have ventilation that we've worked on. Um, one of the other things we've done with ventilation is um, we push in a lot more fresh air than we used to. Um, pushing in fresh air means we need to reheat it, so it costs more in energy. But just pushing in more fresh air and reusing less air is um, really important in trying to make sure that we're not spreading this. Um, masks, HEPA filters, physical distancing. Our students, we're trying to keep them in between three and six feet um, apart. Um, last year, it was six feet. You can't run a school at six feet. I can't get the kids in the school. I can't feed them. So we have to be in this three to six feet range. Um, I feel pretty good. The mask and the ventilation and the HEPA filter actually accounts for about 96% of the risk so really, the, there's not a whole lot of risk. There is still some, um, but most of the risk is being handled by our other um, kind of health protocols. So questions on kind of the COVID part. I'm going to go into the challenges because of this isn't, this isn't our only challenge that we're up against this year. Okay, I'll keep moving. If you, uh, again, have a question or something comes up for you, um, yell and I'll stop it. There we go, check. Yeah, how many kids have been diagnosed while in school and not out when they're out of school? Um, a lot. Uh, I wanna say we're, um, I don't have the total numbers, like the only one that's really interesting to me is how many kids are sick right now, because that's we're trying to keep our schools open. So like the total over time, I don't really know that number, but we, um, I'll talk about it coming up here, but with some of the money we received from the federal <coughs> government, we've hired in health aides into every school and they do most of the screening. So if any, if any student comes to school and all of a sudden during the school day, they feel sick and they might have, they might have a cold, but they also um, COVID, um, sore throat, fever, um, a cough, all of those could be a cold, they could also be COVID. We have um, tests in every one of our schools. And so these health IAs will um, gather up the student, they'll um, check with the parent, they'll run a quick test and inside of 10 minutes, we'll know whether or not the student has COVID or not. And then um, we'll take action at that point by either calling the parents and isolating or depending upon what the situation is. Um, but we've had a number, probably at least half, maybe three quarters of the kids we've found have felt bad at school and then we're um, um, taking action. Yep, Chuck. Uh, have we lost any students yet? No, thank God, no. Um, okay. The, the while it is impacting students, um, this does not seem to be as serious a, um, a health consideration for our young people. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't some students who are being impacted by this. Um, we have a number of medically fragile students that we're particularly um, worried about. But um, for the most part, our kids have been... Um, weathering this and then coming back to school just fine. Um, staff is um, certainly where our staff members are being impacted, both in um, some unvaccinated, most um, are breakthrough cases. Um, about 96, by, by next Monday, 96% of my staff will be um, vaccinated. It's only about 4%. I have about 20 employees who will, um, apply and have received an exception. And those employees will, um, we have extended protocols that they will need to follow. They'll need to stay, they will have to stay outside of six feet of all students. They need to wear a KN95 mask, a better mask 
Um, they need to only eat in isolation. So when the mask comes down, they need to be in an isolated space. Um, there's some other pieces there, but for the most part, um, that's kind of where that's at. Good questions. Um, so our challenges right now, the health protocols, I kind of went through some of those. Um, the other one that we have is so along with all of everything that's going on is, is just there's a lack of staff. So we hired almost 94, I think it was over 100 people um, at the district. Some of, uh, some of this was retirement and people moving. Some of it was um, moving to new kind of new positions. But the um, basic gist of it means we're really short on there's nobody out there to hire. And so as we begin to post positions, so transportation um, is we're, and we're not different, everybody in the state is having this, but basically everybody is short of drivers. And so we started the year missing um, eight drivers, had to combine some routes, um, we had the the secretary at the bus, you know, everybody in the bus company, everybody has a CDL. So it's like the secretary drives, the, the um, boss drives, everybody drives. And we've pretty much been in that state since the beginning of school. We have um, five drivers who by the end of October will um, have finished all their training and become active again, which should help us and begin. One of the problems we're having is transporting when we're delivering kids home and we have to start getting kids to games and activities, we don't have enough drivers. So we're having some, some issues with that. Transportation is coming along. Nutrition services, the um, broken supply chains. We're buying food from Costco and cash and carry right now because of, we're not getting the deliveries um, that we usually get from our um, restaurant. They have some other sources of this. So we're really struggling. Um, so far we have had food every time that we've needed it, but there's gonna be some expended, um, some expenditures, some increased money that it's costing because we're buying things from different places to make sure that we get everybody fed. Um, Substitutes, um, we're short on subs. And we, subs is classified um, folks in our buildings who work as um, instructional aides or as secretaries or as um, those positions and teachers. We've yet to have a single day where we've covered all of our subs, which means that if we don't get a sub from our sub company, then we have to figure out inside our district how to cover it. So we've had administrators here at the district office going out to teach classes. We've had coaches teaching. We have um, principals who are becoming PE teachers. And so what I would tell, what I'm trying to communicate is, um, I know there are folks in our community who have um, education and have um, abilities and we're, we're desperate for all types of help right now, whether it's licensed or whether it's just coming in to be a um, security monitor at lunch. And so if you're interested, get a hold of my HR department, we will put you to work and um, we would be glad to have you right now. So those are some of the base challenges that we have right now in our schools. And then I'm gonna kind of go into some of the, some of the things happening in our schools. Questions again about kind of the start of school and um, how things are working. Yeah, Dave, uh, Tim Pearson here. Great to see you and thanks for, uh, for sharing your information. It's important. Hey, I was just curious. I haven't had an opportunity to, uh, to go any of this, the uh, sporting events there at the Forest Grove High School. And this might be a better question for Doug Thompson, but uh, what, what is the protocol for, for getting into a football game and, and uh, how's that going? So it's, here's what we're doing on sports and activities. Um, it didn't feel right that our kids who were um, running the mile were masked up. Um, it didn't feel quite right. So what we're doing is we're kind of following the same thing they did in the Olympics. And I see the college colleges are doing, which is athletes who are actively competing, they're unmasked. Um, there's a risk with that. What we're trying to do here is not to eliminate all risk, but to be smart about our risk. And so 
Um, in the volleyball court, you'll see the, the girls who are competing will be unmasked and then the folks on the, um, on the sideline will be masked. The spectators will be masked. Um, our big issue is, is that the kids kind of live in each other's bubble. So I'm less worried about them spreading it to each other than the, where those kids are exposed to the other parts of our facility. And so um, football is the same way, which is we're trying to have them mask up. If they go into a locker room and they're gonna do a talk, then we try to have them masked up when they're playing or they're um, exerting themselves, we don't have them masked. Um, so far, what I can tell you is kids have been awesome. Um, kids have not had a problem with masking at all. Now it gets tiring after seven or eight days, but I heard a lot of public comment that said some different things. I'm not seeing that with kids. Kids seem to be doing just fine with it. As a matter of fact, they're the ones who um, are pretty much fed up with folks who don't want to mask. We had a, a situation in a football game where a, a patron would not mask up and it was the kids yelling at them, mask up, you know, you're putting us in danger here. We, we would like to stay in school. Um, the, uh, we've had a couple of situations, but we've dealt with them. And um, by and large though, I would say that's the exception. I would say the rule is people have been great and trying to keep our kids in school. That's the whole thing here. It's like, I just can't let this get out of hand. If we, if we Delta spreads quickly and we have to be vigilant to just follow these procedures and so far it's been working for us. Um, that's kind of where we're at sports wise. We'll One probably follow this. Go ahead. On that Dave, so at the gate, are, are patrons being checked there if they've been vaccinated or, or how is that working? We're not doing vaccination of um, patrons, mostly just because of, and it hasn't come back to bite us at this point. Um, we're just asking everybody to be masked up. Again, masks, um, a two-ply cloth mask accounts for somewhere around 87, 88% of the risk of transmission of Delta. And I know there are people that talk about this doesn't, that's not true. It's a, it is true. Um, and that's what we're seeing. Um, is just a simple thing of put a mask on is helpful um, to make sure that we can stay in school. Court. Yeah, David, a uh, quick question about the, the qualifications of substitutes. That's the hot topic right now. And can you speak to that from your perspective? Yeah, so um, we have different types of um, subs. And so um, just subbing in our we haven't filled, a, we have not had enough subs for our folks who help our organization run, which are all classified. So, and you don't need a whole lot. There may be some, um, but education and experience, I would say, and I'm probably not doing a good job here. Kevin would probably do a better job with, there are some specifics that you need for a classified, but for the most part right now, I think we would just be happy with people helping. Licensed, typically you need a four-year degree and you can get a um, substitutes license. They just lowered that because of the pandemic and the problem that we're having because we need adults in these rooms. Um, now it's, I, I wanna say it's, um, it's less. I, I shouldn't say exactly what, I'll have to send it to anybody. If anybody's interested, like I said, contact our HR department and we'll get you squared away or give me a piece of email and I'll get you connected with whoever you need. But I know there are folks who have, um, who I, we've hired before who make a choice to stay home with family and, with, um, and they have skill sets and they've worked. I love hiring them because they come to work every day and um, they're smart and they have um, previous experience in a business of, of working. And all of those are were wonderful characteristics for us. Butch. So I'll just address Tim's comment as a facilitator at soccer games. Um, all the visiting teams receive a, a printout from Doug and Monica, which kind of explains what the protocols are. Um, in the 14 soccer games that I've done this fall, I've, I've maybe had one parent question me on mask and I just go, hey, that's what we're doing here. And then he goes, put this mask on, he goes and sits down. So no one's no one's uh, hassling on it. 
uh, witnessing the girls and boys play soccer last spring with masks on. It was enjoyable watching them do what they were doing, but this fall has been that much more rewarding without masks for the athletes. So, I mean, there's a, there's a, a lot of uh, upfront work that the athletic departments have done um, to expedite and make that easier. And then one thing we do at the varsity games is we have masks available. If a person shows up to watch their um, grandson or uh, granddaughter or grandson play soccer and they don't have a mask, we give them a mask. So um, we're, we're very positive and encouraging on it. So, um, and that's from uh, the leadership of Doug and Monica. Perfect, thanks. So I want to just talk a little bit about finances and kind of some, some things that have gone on. So um, we, most of our expenditures, we have a general fund that comes from the state. We get it based on the number of students we have and the types of students in our district. And then there's some other grant funds that we also have that we use, but for the most part, the general fund is what we um, use. We staff currently 24 to one K4 is kind of our class size. Um, five, six is a little larger. We're trying to get it down. It's around 27 and a half. And then um, at the secondary level, um, the it's hard to explain, but the basic gist is um, the class sizes that you'll see in actually walking into classrooms is usually right around 30. Um, it could go less, it could be 26, it could be 34, but usually they fall right around the 30 range right now. With the pandemic though, there's been a lot of stuff going on. We dropped um, 300 plus students out of our district last year, which is about $3 million worth of general fund. And we're down probably 180 students this year from what we budgeted. Um, folks are making choices to go to online charter schools. Some of them are worried about COVID in the school, so they, they want their kids to stay away. We, um, there's lots of reasons why people are choosing to do that. But what I wanted to talk briefly about is the, gover um, the federal government had three stimulus um, programs to K-12 schools. ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. ESSER 1 was about a million dollars and it was made um, mostly for um, purchasing PPE, the, um, the, all of the, when you walk into our schools now, you have um, hand sanitizer and you have masks. And then we hired in um, health IAs into every building to kind of manage these processes. And um, so ESSER 1 has been totally spent out in the 18 months that we've had. We're finishing ESSER 2, and then ESSER 3 is the largest. It's about $9 million. Um, my total budget is somewhere with all the grants and everything is somewhere around about $100 million. And so this is a sizable, it's about 10% of the budget. It's for three year period of time. So really we have about $3 million that we're working with this year. Some of the things that we're doing with this ESSER 3 money is um, redoing ventilation systems. And um, to redo a school ventilation system is $10 million. So what we're doing is kind of working on pieces of it, but you can't actually um, fix a whole ventilation system with um, this kind of money. Um, we're looking at interventions because of um, we've just finishing our assessments on where kids are at. We haven't really seen them in person really for about 18 months. And so we're doing some testing to kind of find out where kids literacy and where their math is. And I think um, I'll know more specifically, but there's at least, there's probably half of our students who need an intervention of some sort. So we're pushing out money from this ESSER fund to the schools to do that. Um, some of this ESSER money was, um, we ran a program over the summer of activities for students, um, both K through 12. There was some summer money, but we also needed to use some of our ESSER funds to do that. So there's a, we're also paying for um, out of ESSER some technology and there's a whole series of different things that, that are coming from this. We just finished our audit last Friday. What I can tell you is we're not in a terrible spot. Um, we lost about a million dollars in enrollment. So that would have mean, that would have meant cuts. We saved about a million dollars between April and June 
we didn't need as many subs. We uh, moved some of the, the ESSER funds here, paid for some things that we would have done with our general fund. So all in all, we're kind of coming out of this in a decent place. Our current class sizes that we, you actually see, K4, is right around 18 or 19. So currently our class sizes are pretty low. There are some exceptions, some bubbles in different schools, but by and large we're, um, and normally in a normal school year, if I saw a class at 15, I would be collapsing classes to, because it's too low. We, we staffed at 24 to one, and now we're at 15. We're not, we've got too many staff. I'm not gonna be able to afford to pay for that. But with this ESSER money, I think what we're gonna end up doing is we're not gonna be, um, we're gonna let it roll through the school year. Um, which means we'll maintain those lower class sizes. As the kids are coming back, that's important because it, we'll be able to provide more attention to each of these kids um, and trying to get them caught up. Um, but all in all, we're not in a terrible spot. There are other districts because of we're not, basically every district that I've talked to in the state has lost enrollment. So they're all having to deal with how do we manage the finance of, the, uh, of this? So, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, questions, 12.57, I didn't do too bad. I would end this with just this comment, which is um, kids are in school. I can't tell you how happy it makes us and our teachers to just be interacting with kids. And that's really the joy. I, I will tell you, dealing with the adults has been a little hard um, this fall and maybe unpleasant. Dealing with kids has been awesome. And um, kids are loving being back in school, learning. Um, I mean, we did, I will tell you that 18 months in their bedroom, um, some of the behavior we saw coming back to school. We've been working a lot on systems and um, habits and those kinds of things, but all in all things are, the kid part of this is going great. It was, uh, yes, thank you very much for, for sharing what's going on with the district and thank you for your leadership in our community. It is, uh, it's uh, having strong leaders like you in place really helps us get through these challenging times. So it's a, it's a big team. We have lots of people, both community and um, our folks around us. I mean, we're all, we're all in this together.